Good morning, Central UMC. It is a glorious morning to worship, and I'm glad you can join us. Um, I want to say this morning, God blesses us through suffering and troubled times. Remember that God's grace moves through unexpected people and unexpected things. You know, as to announcements this morning, I just have a few things I want to bring to your attention. Uh, first, you can continue to uh, send your prayer requests in to me uh, by messenger or text or whatever works for you. Or you can call them into the office and we will get them. Uh, also, in, on June 7th, uh, so two weeks from today, we'll be celebrating all graduates um, here in worship. Um, but today, uh, May 17th, I, I want to acknowledge that if things were normal, if we were back, uh, back to normal and not in the middle of this still pandemic, um, that uh, right now at 10 a.m. on May 17th, Nick Wilford would be walking in his graduation from St. John's University today. And, and uh, we're, we're with you, Nick. Congratulations. So if you would turn uh, in the uh, bulletins that came out on Facebook this morning uh, to our call to worship. Welcome to the house of God. This is a place of acceptance and love. Praise be to the Lord. In the midst of our struggles, God is offering hope. Praise be to the Lord. God is working to renew us all. Praise be to the Lord. As witnesses of God's grace journey together in love. Praise be to the Lord. Amen. We're going to sing this morning number 152. If you happen to have a hymnal, um, it's I Sing the Almighty Power of God. Join me, if you would, in this morning's opening prayer. Loving God, thank you for being with us through every step of the storms of life. Thank you that you are Jehovah Nisi. You go before us and you know what lies ahead. For this we place our trust in you. We strive to wholly lean on you. And into your care we place our worries, our hopes, and our burdens. For your unwavering love and care we say thank you. In Christ's name, Amen. This morning we're going to hear Wiggle Time from Miss Janice. Good morning, boys and girls. Um, today I want to talk to you about God's grace. What is grace? Well, I have an history to tell you. There was a boy who got in trouble in the school for disobeying. And when he got back home, his father was pretty angry and sent him 
came to his room without no dinner. But in a little bit, dad went back to his room to talk to him and ask the boy, what do you think your punishment should be? The boy put his head down and say, I should be grounded for two weeks. The father answered, I agree with that. That sounds like a fearing punishment. But instead, I'd like you to come out to the kitchen and have dinner with us. And then I'm going to take you for ice cream. The boy was puzzled. But the father said, my son, that is grace. Grace is receiving a blessing you didn't earn and didn't deserve. This is how God treats us. He doesn't love us less if we do something wrong or love us more if we do the right thing. Grace means that God forgive us and do amazing things for us simply because he loves us. In fact, the Bible say that is, that is how we get to heaven. Not being perfect, but by God's grace. God saved you by grace when you believe and you can take, you can not take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. You and me are saved by grace. Saved because God loves us. He loves us very much. His grace is so big that he loves us very much. Because God treated us with grace. We should treat others with that same kindness. Accept each other just as Christ has accepted you so that God will be giving glory. You see, sometimes people do things to hurt us and feelings. Or sometimes because we think that we're wrong. But when that happens, we have the opportunity to show grace to someone else to give them a blessing that they didn't earn or deserve remember that is how god treat us and that is how you treat others we are saved by grace we live by grace i hope you guys enjoy my history and hopefully we can see each other soon love you guys bye Amen. Thank you, Jamis. Um, our scripture this morning is Ruth chapter 4, verses 3 to 17, and Jeff Rakowski is going to share that with us. I hope everyone's doing as well as possible, given what's going on. Um, so we're going to read Ruth, passage 4, 3 through 17. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative, Emelik. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. No one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now in earlier times in Israel for the redemption and transfer of the property to become final, one party took off the sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed the sandal. 
Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of the Amalek, Kilian, and Nalon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, Nalon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among his family or from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Lee, who together built up the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephthoreth and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to his son. The woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who love you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The woman living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I know there were uh, some tough names in there, so you handled it well. Thank you, sir. Um, so I, I kind of left you hanging last week at the end of my story. If you remember, the story started out with last week. I had failed out as a freshman in the fall semester at Temple University in 1982. I didn't just let myself down, but I let my mom down. But that obviously was not the end of the story. I mean, I was down on myself for a couple of years, kicking around town, doing nothing important, nothing really productive. Finally, in the fall of 1985, I decided it was time to get back on the horse, so to speak. I enrolled for one class at Burlington County College, and I started working toward some kind of college degree. Now, if you're familiar with the timelines, it takes two years of full-time study to complete an associate's degree, another two years, or four total, to complete a bachelor's degree, and another three years full-time study for a master's in divinity. So if I were going full-time right at that point in 1985, it would have taken me seven years, 1992, I could have finished seminary if I'd been going full-time. I wasn't. I started studies in 1985. I earned my associate's degree in liberal arts from Camden County College in the spring of 1999. 14 years to earn a two year degree. At that point though, I did leave my full time job in the hospital in order to study full time. And I earned my bachelor's in liberal arts with the concentrations in philosophy, religion, and literature in 2001, so two years, from Thomas Edison State College. And then I immediately started in the fall of 2001 at seminary, Eastern Baptist Theological School, uh, uh, on a first year full scholarship. I took full-time classes while serving a church part-time and earned my MDiv in 2004. All that is to say that even when I believed that I had failed, even when I was in a bad place emotionally and mentally and spiritually, God wasn't done with me yet. Yes, it was a bad time, but see, this is the thing. Bad times don't last forever. Do you, you remember last week how we discussed it's okay to not be okay? 
Well, during that message, I asked you to remember a difficult time in your life. Do you remember what came to mind? What were some particularly dark times in your life? And then, as you're thinking about those, about those rough spots, those dark places, do you remember at all seeing a light at the end of the tunnel? Can you recall any moments in the middle of the darkness where you saw just a sliver of light, just a shot at hope? Because there are moments in all those tough times in our lives where if we're looking, if we're paying attention, we can see evidence of God's grace at work. And, you know, this is an idea that really comes very clear in this morning's text. If you've been following my daily devotions for this week, we have talked about Ruth's journey. Because we started with Ruth last Sunday. We talked, excuse me, about Ruth's journey to where this passage finds her today. And, and particularly Ruth and Naomi and what they have been through. They've been through some dark places, some really tough times. Naomi lost her, son, her husband and both of her sons. Ruth lost her, her husband, who was one of Naomi's sons. And because Ruth had been displaced from her home and country, she had to travel to a strange land with Naomi. She wasn't an Israelite, but here she was in Bethlehem. Here she's had to go and glean the fields for food to survive. It's been a rough patch for her, for sure. But here's the thing. There is no limit to where God's blessings can come from. You see, in these ancient times, Moabites were considered to be the enemies of the people of Israel. So folks in Israel in Bethlehem would not have been very friendly with Ruth. Scripture tells us that, that the, the Jews considered those people outside of God's blessing. But you know, Ruth pushed past the pressures of her society. Ruth, a Moabite woman, makes a bold choice. She takes control of her life. The text here shows us how God works through human agency and human action. You know, sometimes we think of God just dropping miracles from on high. But really, it's the work of people that's God's work. After her husband's death, Ruth chooses to stay faithful to her mother-in-law, Naomi. It's an uncomfortable choice because it requires her to live apart from her family of origin, to, to move from her native land. She chooses to glean the fields to feed both herself and Naomi. And by grace, she finds a protector and eventually a husband in Boaz. Boaz, for his part, is impressed by Ruth's bravery and by her faithfulness. And you see, over the course of this journey, by grace, a time of suffering becomes a blessing. As Ruth becomes part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. Through Ruth, Naomi was nourished in her old age by the care for, for Ruth's baby, Obed. While Naomi suffered the loss of her husband and sons as well as the loss of security and meaning that family structure carried with it in her society, because of God's grace and God's work in unexpected ways and unexpected relationships, Naomi was able to find a new joy, new meaning in her life, new relationship with Ruth and with Ruth's family and a new grandson, Obed. Now, I think there's two really important points we've got to draw out of this passage. First, God's timing is not our timing. That one's hard to, to grasp sometimes. 
I learned that one in the years between finishing seminary in 2004 and being ordained in 2014. You see, most people walk that path from finishing seminary to ordination, two or three years, five at the max. I took 10. God's timing for me was a few extra years. And look at where we are today. We may be, we may be tiring of staying at home, of isolation. We may be tiring of reading those reports every day of all the new illnesses and all the new deaths and all the increasing numbers of unemployment. And I imagine that many of us are crying out, how long? How long, oh Lord, do we have to do this? And like I said, that's okay, because it's okay to not be okay. God is going to work in God's time. Second point here, I think, is that God works, as I said, through human beings. Through Ruth and Boaz and Naomi and Obed. Right now, we have to wait. But we don't have to wait idly. We can ask ourselves, you know, where is God calling us to work, to be a part of God's grace in this world? John Wesley taught that grace, as Jamie said, is unearned. But God provides us means of grace. Ways that God works through ourselves and through human actions for us to experience grace. Vehicles of God's grace. Wesley broke the means of grace down into two categories. He said works of piety and works of mercy. Works of piety are things like reading, meditating, studying the scriptures. Prayer. Fasting. Regular worship. Healthy living. Sharing our faith with other people as well as things like sharing in the sacraments and accountability to one another and organized Bible studies. Those are works of piety. Works of mercy are ways we experience grace by helping others. Doing good works, visiting the sick, visiting those in prison, feeding the hungry, giving generously to the needs of others. Things like justice and ending oppression and discrimination. I mean, John Wesley was one of, the, one of the early Methodists to call for an end to slavery. Addressing the needs of the poor. These are works of mercy. All of these are ways that we experience the grace of God in our lives. And you know this. If you have ever served in a soup kitchen, if you've ever gone on a mission trip, and you went to help others, and you came away feeling better about yourself, that's God's grace. That was a work of grace in your life. You experienced the means of grace. And we can do that even in dark times, like right now. So in moments when you think you are out of reach, beyond any point of refuge, God's grace can still reach you. God's grace can still reach all of us. So, I want you to stop right now and think about where you are. I mean, where you are in your head. I know that this time has been tough on us. Physically, emotionally, spiritually. But thinking of where you are right now. How are you seeing God at work in your life this week? Even in the darkness of this time, how can you reframe, turn your focus on the dark places in your life and instead see God's light shining in that darkness? Where are the slivers of hope? You know, we journey here from it's okay to not be okay to being found by grace. Even in these difficult times, God's grace still abounds. Now, mind you, friends, this doesn't happen 
instantaneously. It doesn't happen overnight. And it doesn't mean, by the way, that these difficult times don't matter. But exactly in and through these difficult times is when we can come to know God's love in new, different, unexpected ways. I mean, it doesn't mean that, that God intentionally brings these hardships. The coronavirus is not an act of God. God didn't send this so we might learn something. Our suffering isn't some kind of test. But instead, I want to refer you to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. All things work together for the good of those who love God. What's God doing in the middle of this? How is God bringing grace into your life in the middle of this? God's blessing through suffering takes years to manifest in Ruth and Naomi's lives. It doesn't happen overnight. Naomi's life in the height of darkness and bitterness took a major turn because Ruth did not leave her. You remember Orpah last week? left her and went back to Moab. Ruth says, I won't leave. And that made all the difference in Naomi's life. Because Ruth walked alongside her and supported her. So I'm going to challenge you this week. This week, think about someone who has journeyed with you in a difficult time, whether it's this difficult time or some other difficult time in your life. Someone who has supported you in the hard times. Someone who has always been by your side as your personal light in dark places. And then I want you to reach out to that person and thank them for being a light in your life. Show your gratitude for God's grace working through them to you. And then go a step further. Consider who is it that God is calling you to be Ruth to? Who is God calling you to walk alongside and support? You know, even though we may be struggling through our own difficulties and our own tough times and our own darkness right now, God calls us to walk alongside one another. Who are you going to be Ruth to, to their Naomi? Amen. So I'm going to invite you to uh, follow on the screen this morning as we join together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So, one of the means of grace that I did mention in this morning's message is that of giving and so this is an opportunity to practice that means of grace by giving back to your church as the church can give back to our community. Um, if you would like to mail in your offering, you'll see the address on the screen there or in your bulletin, Central UMC, 729 Arnold Avenue, Point Pleasant Beach. Um, or you can go online to our conference website at www.gnjumc.org slash online giving. Enter the church name Central, the church number 5053, the district is Northern Shore, and the city is Point Pleasant.
Let us pray. Loving God, we ask you to bless all the means of grace to us, but today especially we're thinking about that means of grace called giving. So we ask you to bless our offerings that we might use them well and wisely to continue to lift up your presence and your grace in the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Let's start one more hymn this morning, number 356. If you happen to have a hymnal, it's When We Are Living. So friends, as you receive the benediction, just want to remind you that uh, Sunday school uh, for the children will be at 11 a.m. You should have gotten a Zoom invite uh, this week, or it's the same number that we've been using for the last several weeks. Um, and thank you to Miss Nancy and Miss Tempe for uh, pulling that together each week. I know my boys have definitely been blessed by it. Um, to receive the benediction. Go now into this harsh, difficult world, knowing that even in the darkness, God shines a light for you, and that light is his grace. Go in peace. Amen. Take care and God bless, friends. We will see you soon.